Rylowitz from SBD. Thanks again for coming to this. Uh, I'm Jeff Deckman, um, and I work for the uh, first season of Mind Market Power Rangers. Hi, everybody. And I'm Ronnie Sperling. Uh, Jeff and I wrote together, and we wrote for the very first season of Power Rangers. We were there from the beginning.
that maybe Trini was having a problem wearing glasses in school or something like that. So that's I, basically the monster would delineate the American uh, footage. Episodes, all these favorite part of some episodes. We we wrote um, one called "For Whom the Bell Trolls," and um, so the, the monster is Mr. Tickle Sneezer. He's this very bizarre kind of troll guy who um, who isn't really a villain. He's kind of you don't know kind of he's a doll and he turns in, he's turned into a villain, but he's not really a villain. And there were all these things about he's capturing things, so we didn't know whether he's stealing. And then kind of the network said, "Oh no, we can't be stealing." And so kind of back and forth. It was a really really hard episode to write. They didn't quite know what to do with him because in the Japanese footage, which is all we had at the time, he didn't get blown up because he wasn't a bad guy, so what's left for him to do? So at the end of the episode, with the Japanese footage, he just kind of wanders off on his own into the sunset. And then after we wrote that, we didn't, we didn't continue to work on it after we turned in our final script, but then I think Saban or somebody said, oh no, you can't have him just wander off on the sunset. You gotta just turn the episode into a dream. So it's kind of oh. turned into a dream, <laughs> strangely. And, and so that was a, a really tough one. But Bill Patrick doesn't get out of the show. I, was, I must say, it, uh, the uh, recent Disney uh, redone versions of the original episodes, which are on ABC, um, I just kind of came across one. And I gotta tell you, the hottest thing about that episode was going into Trini's bedroom, and she's wearing that yellow baby doll pajamas. I mean, that was really hot. <laughs> Next question. I, I, I kind of feel like the uh, monkey in the middle or the cheese that stands alone here. Am I the only, like, non savant person on the panel? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> so I just real quick to answer that question. Like, um, so all of the Disney were standalone seasons. And um, being the new executive producer, I'm just all, it was like an all-new show. You know, so I didn't have to worry about past seasons, future seasons. It was like an in and out kind of thing. The only people we really had to worry about were you guys, because every time we decided to do something that was outside the Ranger universe, like we instantly got feedback. You know, <laughs> that's not how it would happen. That's you know, in 13 years, it's never been that way. So we had to do a lot of research, but we didn't have to really worry about. You know, it definitely was a standalone situation. I think that, uh, to answer that question, I think it was challenging, you know, just getting the footage and trying to figure out the story from the footage, but it was also the thing that made the show really exciting to do. So we had to do that. Um, the, probably the most challenging one for me was the first episode I did, which was uh, called Second Chance. And the reason it was titled Second Chance was because it almost didn't get made. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, I had uh, submitted to a, a spec script to Power Rangers in 1993, about fall of 1993, and uh, Ellen Levy Sarnoff took a look at it and liked it, and she called me up and she said, Mark, I'm going to give you a shot, I'm going to give you a monster. And that's how we did it, we were given <laughs> monsters in, in video footage, I created a storyline for that, that they had, she took Took a look at it, but there's some elements that weren't quite working for her, and uh, uh, so I had to spend a night really thinking pretty hard uh, 15, 16 years ago, and uh, came up with something that she she approved, and uh, we went forward with that, uh, and uh, and from there I started working on the show, uh, from that show to VR Troopers to Mass Rider, and I did about 50 episodes in all for uh, for Spawn from that first one. So it was both the cha most challenging one. Uh, and uh, I did a lot of Billy episodes, too. Uh, Rangers of Two Worlds, part one and part two, was was, was mine. Uh, and uh, that was one of the fun ones. The other was Wild, uh, uh, Wild West Rangers, parts one and two. I like that. So. Yeah. That was because I was from Arizona. <laughs> and I said, there's a cactus monster. I have to have it. <laughs> I didn't write enough to really, yeah. I mean, I only wrote two scripts because I was so busy with uh, other stuff at Sabata at the time. But um, what I enjoyed about, I don't know, what I enjoyed about the whole Power Rangers concept uh, was that the people who worked on it were more like family and it was very, well, it was very collegial, uh, the way we all worked together, and nobody 
had much. There were other shows where if you changed the writer's words, they were up in arms about it. <laughs> but um, on Power Rangers, it was a very collegial kind of feeling, and everybody kind of worked together to make the show better. Um, and it was a real, real good feeling as an actor, as a writer too. But and as, especially as an actor, going in there, it was like everybody was working for the same reason, just to make the show as good as we could make it. And that was, that was a lot of fun. Well, um, you and I dealt with the front end of the scripts. Um, we didn't plan anything until we looked at the footage. It was just dumb to because we had no idea what was coming. We, we would know that we want to have an episode. It being, we need a bulk episode. We need a training episode. We knew that, but not what that would be. Sometimes we would write uh, based on footage that we got. But then I, I think sometimes, even in the first season, um, there was some point where a lot of the costumes were sent over from Japan. So they were actually, after they had the scripts, they were actually able to um, to add new footage based on having these costumes. So basically there, there were things that you, you, you were kind of forced to write to certain footage that later on just actually, actually went away. So. And I had to add, uh, speaking of the costumes, we, we didn't have the costumes, all the Japanese costumes, for such a long time. Then, somehow, in the middle of the first season, they all showed up, and we were allowed to use these these creatures in the American footage. And Jeff and I arrived on the set, and uh, they weren't shooting that afternoon, so everything was almost pitch dark. And we walked into we walked into the high school set, and nobody was there except for Jeff and I. And imagine this room without the lights on. And we opened the main classroom door up, and do you remember this? And the classroom was just filled with the entire season of monsters. <laughs> it was the creepiest Twilight Zone room you've ever been in your life. When the, when the Japanese were done with the costumes, they sent them to us in these big containers. And when they arrived, we don't know if all the pieces are going to be there, if the sword is going to if the ears are going to be there. Because they do a lot of fights with the costumes, and the pieces get broken off and fall apart. And so the first thing we do is inventory, and if the costume didn't come, then that footage, we can't use it, or we have to use it self-contained without the costume, because they're too expensive to build. And then after we use them, they all would go into this warehouse where we had literally hundreds. We built these kind of these things out of two by fours and pulled up the costumes. It looked like the terracotta army. We had hundreds of these costumes. It was unbelievable. And they were disgusting and stinky, because they use them, as, they use them you know, in Japan for stunts, and they, the guys sweat in them. And yeah, they come the here, rubber. yeah, and the foam rubber absorbs the sweat. It deteriorates, it's just released. It's terrible. Yeah. And the guys constantly get <laughs> ear infections and stuff from these things. It's just disgusting. And uh, so we, well, I remember they would come in exactly that. We'd dump them on the floor and we'd spread them apart. And we, we would look at the most bizarre weapons and we had to look at the footage and figure out what the hell this weapon is and what head it goes with and what leg and what arm. <laughs> remember, sometimes we had. And then after it would get punched, it would grow something, and then it would grow something else. It would be like three different versions. The monsters were a huge mess. Wait, you're saying the monsters grew? <laughs> <laughs> oh, wait, that happened in every episode. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> 
Jeff and I would typically, I think even before we'd start writing, we would start just improv with the two of us, and then that would end up on the page. And also, um, obviously, you get like Japanese footage. I've never seen the original Japanese episodes or anything, but you get the footage and then you build like a storyline around like whatever monster is there. But I was wondering if you ever like watched those episodes into not footage, but like actual storyline from those episodes. <laughs> I, to refresh my memory for all this, I, I watched um, the, the first episode that we wrote is um, a, a Jason episode of Pressing Engagement. So I was watching the Japanese footage that that was based on the, the entire episode just this past week as we used to get the <coughs> episodes. And that episode was about the monster King Sphinx was in that episode, but the, the Japanese footage itself was about kids being kidnapped kind of by a human version of King Sphinx, so they turned into the monster version. He would trap them literally inside giant redwood trees, and then yeah. someone would come with a, a chainsaw and start cutting into the trees. So they had to save these little kids before they were cut in half. So the Japanese story was always much more violent and scary <laughs> than, than yeah. anything. Yeah. Wonder why we came up with new stories? Yeah. <laughs> most of the time, toward, towards the end, most of the time they didn't get the full episodes. That was really right at the beginning. Right. Uh, after about mid-season, we would just send the writers just the footage that they had to work with. Chances are, no. And we didn't see, I never saw a translation for three years ago. But the Japanese had great stories sometimes. I would guess that out of my, I probably wrote 200 episodes, and I would guess that there were 20 of them in the episodes. And it was so much simpler if you could just take their story. Oh, sure. So much simpler. <clears throat> Yeah, <laughs> in this case, uh, it was a good thing. 
Uh, and uh, but uh, I also did a couple of uh, episodes where Billy would leave the Rangers because occasionally Billy would leave the Rangers. <laughs> and in this case, uh, there was one called Graduation Blues, where he graduated. Uh, it, it turned out he had been going to high school and had already had enough credits to graduate like a semester ago. And so, so they said, "You've got to go. You've got to get out of here." Um, and I was always I enjoyed that one. Studio by five o'clock today, hire me to see you. 
and it was like, eh, and he was not pleased with the episode. And um, uh, it was, he, he wasn't mean about it, but, but he was very firm that he didn't like it. It was, it, was, it was a whole plot line for the end of the first season that actually, I think, there were about 10 episodes or something, toward the end of that first season that kind of were thrown out and rewritten, and we were amongst those. So our episode eventually never got made, but it, was, it would have been the, the, the end of the, of the first season as, as the initial 40 episode order, and it was thrown out. But it was, it was kind of one of those trepidatious moments of, you know, sitting across the table waiting for the meeting to start, and I am just kind of on the phone, and you're like, what's going to come out of this? So that was, I think, my, my low point. He's an intimidating man. Yes. <laughs> um, I don't know. It, it, I can't really say what the hardest thing about SPD was. Disney. Um, but uh, <laughs> did I say that? Those but of us who are all laughing have all worked for Disney. <laughs> it, it, it was a, just an interesting thing. It was um, the show was put in a new arena, and they were really trying to put you know the, the square peg of Power Rangers into the I can't even finish that sentence, that sounds over. You know what I'm saying? They were trying to change the model of it. And it was interesting to have conversations about Power Rangers where they were like, we really can't have any fighting. <laughs> like, we really need to cut down the amount of action because it's, um, you know, parents tend to get upset. And just having strange conversations about you know, going back to the, uh, the wormhole episodes. Um, in the Japanese footage, they villain, the monster, has these gems, and somehow we tied that into how the um, Dino Thunder uh, Rangers got into the future. So my theory was that the villain was like a scientist monster. I wanted it to be cloning, and we had these intense, like, hour-long arguments about children don't understand cloning, but time travel was a more legitimate vehicle. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, it was just... Very, very difficult in that because it's like the whole thing is kind of a cartoon, like anything can go. And I don't know how you can, the semantics of that. I look at something now like Clone Wars, that's huge, and I'm like, oh, what a missed opportunity. <laughs> so, and time travel never makes any sense to me. They were good. I think one of the best things for me was, again, like seeing the show become what it became when we were. You'd write the show, I was writing, and I would actually hear the kids at the time start repeating, you know, playing Power Rangers in their front yards. And it was really cool to see that kind of start and the phenomenon that it became. And um, I think the worst thing was meetings with Hyam. He would, he would have, uh, he'd be having massages during the meetings that I used to have. And it was just really weird. But, <laughs> Strange Japanese, yeah, Japanese desserts. Yeah, no, he wouldn't offer anyone else. While being the song. Oh, you okay. didn't want to eat it. No. Trust me. <laughs> <laughs> I never got the meeting. No, I didn't, I didn't get the massage meeting. You were wearing the suits. Yeah. <laughs> um, for, for myself, uh, some of the best times of the show were that, uh, that first couple of years, first two or three years when we realized kind of what, what we had going. Going there the, the day at Universal Amphitheater when uh, I remember being caught in the traffic jam that was extended six miles long or, or longer. That's uh, a crazy day. Yeah, it was. Um, and to, to be in the middle of that and, and kind of know what it is that uh, was, was, was happening out in the world because you're pretty much at your keyboard and you're coming up with these, these things. And for me, for a long time, I was working out of my house and uh, coming into the office every couple of weeks. So uh, that was that was one. But there was, for worst experience, I won't call this worst experience, but oddest experience, uh, there was a time where a, uh, uh, we had somebody come into the show and nobody here uh, for about a three or four week period who uh, was doing some show running uh, and uh, asked us to write Asked us to write a script about, uh, uh, or asked me to write a script about where Tommy's accused of racism, uh, and uh, he also had a scene where some of the girls were in bikinis and in a jacuzzi, and we said to, to this particular guy, we said, I don't think this doesn't sound like the show to us, but but okay, uh, because uh, and true enough, it was it was mixed pretty pretty quickly, so. So the script exists somewhere. Uh, All right. Yeah,
imagine you had that past broadcast standards. Yeah, yeah, me either. This is for uh, Greg. So many of crew had a lot of surprises working you know, on their conditions. What was it like having this meeting? Pretty <laughs> universal. Uh, Last answer. Yeah, it, it, it was uh, their standards and practices are very, very high. So they um, pretty much get down to the details of like the foods that the rangers are eating while we're filming and having a meal. Uh, it seems like there's any kind of danger in the children, they'll pull it out. And it, that's just not real life. You forget, you know, like suddenly that a, you know, a banana is a threat to a child. <laughs> you know, it just seemed funny at the time. say whether something is or is not in canon when you were still making it up. Or not. You know, it was still a new, there was no timeline yet. There was nothing, it was, it was all still very new. So, uh, so yes, it's in canon. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so. Fear of eviction. <laughs> Paycheck <laughs> makes a difference. He took work, but mainly just stay in the room. Don't be distracted by the stuff around you. You gotta just stay, and even when you're gonna hate it, but you, you gotta stay there. But it's also like going to the gym. You should find a partner. Someone, if you go to the gym with somebody, you're gonna show up for sure. You can go to the, meet somebody at Starbucks, right? For one hour, don't try to maybe, don't try to overdo yourself. But go there with somebody so you have to do that. Good question. Okay, last question.